President, fellows and guests, thank you very much for coming this evening. Uh, can everybody hear me? Please uh, say if you can't. Um, I feel this is a, a great privilege uh, coming here this evening to talk about um, the Udall site in North Uis. It's especially poignant because it's 50 years since Ian Crawford first uh, decided to, to, to look at these islands and the Udall site in particular as his research topic. Now, why the Udall is, is special, not only to me, but to several people in this audience, is that it's one of the largest sites ever dug in Scotland. It was one of the largest, uh, sorry, one of the longest archaeological projects ever undertaken there. It lasted over 31 years. And it is unfortunately one of the largest sites in Scotland that has never been published <laughs> to date. So my story is not just of the Oodle and what was found there and what we're, we're hoping to do next, but it is about Ian Crawford himself, this rather enigmatic archaeologist who probably would not refer to himself primarily as an archaeologist, but as an historian. And I, I, he, in his papers, I, I managed to find a, a sort of CV so um, I thought I'd, I'd put this, this up. And in 1963, he began fieldwork on the Udall, and I mentioned there, but he started about 1960, beginning his researches into his published work, Contributions to a History of Domestic Settlement in North Uist. And it was this looking for settlement that went back in time that was the thrust of his work at uh, the Udall. Um, he was a very enterprising man. Um, he was dealing with a subject, domestic settlement, that was not necessarily very popular at that point, uh, and it was a subject area that was in its infancy. And many of the things that he was interested in, we didn't have names for at that time, such as climate studies, and environmental studies. He, was, he had quite an eclectic um, view and a holistic view on uh, archaeology. <coughs> but I want to, to put the Udall in context. Um, here it is, right over on the west coast of, uh, of the Western Isles. A difficult place to get to, even now, and when Ian Crawford was digging there, it must have been even more difficult. Um, he was living uh, in Edinburgh when he started. During the course of the project, he moved to, to Cambridge and then back to the, the borders, uh, the Dumfries and Galloway area of, of Scotland. And if you can imagine, <coughs> Packing up your family, your dogs, your equipment, and carting a whole lot by road and ferries to North Uist to live in quite primitive conditions um, and do this for 31 years and also attract people from literally all over the world to come and help you must have been quite a feat of um, engineering and project management. But what, by showing you this, this map of the site, I, I wanted to put it in its sort of geographical context. It's not facing Scotland, it's facing the ocean. And this is, to me, uh, makes this rather special. Um, as the President said, I have worked a lot in, in the Northern Isles, where the Northern Isles were on easy trade routes to Norway, down the east coast of, of Scotland, but the Udall is not. It, the Udall is away from um, normal uh, trade routes or, or, or coastal routes. Um, 
I've pinpointed it here on this peninsula. And I wanted to show you here the, the maca, the sandy shell, the very fertile sandy shell areas that um, run up the west coast of Scotland into which a prehistoric settlement was established. Its fertility, its contrast with the more inhospitable inland areas of uh, this island group but are quite remarkable. It's famous for its, its uh, spring flowers. It, you can overwinter uh, cattle and sheep out on this maca environment uh, the whole year round. It's very, very fertile. And so where you have maca, you mostly have prehistoric settlement. The modern settlement is along the lines of the road. So settlement has actually moved inland because of uh, repeated uh, blown sand events, um, really ever since the sand started to move in around about 5,000 years uh, uh, ago. So that, I'm trying to, to put this uh, in context for you. But you know, why the Uber? Why choose this remote area? I've mentioned the fact that we have the Maka fertile, we have Ian Crawford found evidence um, of documents that went back to um, the 15th century, mentioning this area in particular. That we have place name evidence, and he also knew the work, the published work of Erskine Beveridge, <coughs> who was who had explored this area, he'd lived in, in, in the region and found souterrain and plenty of evidence to su suggest that was prehistoric activity in this area. I think also because of the historical background, the archaeology, the, it, it appealed also to Crawford's <coughs> other interests, the ethnography, the environmental studies that that grew ever more prominent in his, in his work. And also climate change, which in the 1960s was not a phrase we would necessarily have recognized for what it is today. And before I actually tell you a little bit about the archeology, span I, I wanted to, to put uh, the Udall in, in, in context uh, a little bit about the, the way Crawford dug in, in relation to, uh, to other sites, which I shall come on to in a moment. Um, he realized fairly early on that the depth of sand across the areas he chose to dig were in excess of two meters. And to ask, in, in, in the first instance, local people to come with shovels and start digging a large extent of sand away was an impractical um, occupation for succeeding years. So he bought from what was what, what is now the coal authority um, some rail and a little bogey, and that's in the, the top uh, picture. And he there we go, a little bogey on wheels and track that he laid out and literally carted the sand away from the site on the, what was termed the North Uist Light Railway. <laughs> and I think, as far as I know, that it was the only railway, railway track ever to uh, see the light of day on North Uist. So that, that was new, it was innovatory. He used um, sieving machines <coughs> and conveyor belts and often, uh, as far as I'm aware, built these through, from his own design. I think he, he uh, was very clever in being able uh, to do this. You know, we are, we're going back 50 years where standard three-dimensional recording of finds and stratigraphy was not necessarily common practice, and certainly not in Scotland. And so the use of um, 
three-dimensional recording was quite new. But Ian Crawford was very keen to make certain that everything possible was recorded uh, in uh, the best way possible. He started off by using the Wheeler sort of box method of digging in, in square trenches, but realised, I think, fairly soon that that was not necessarily the most practical way of digging in sand. And I, I, I actually think that uh, the bottom picture here is, is a photograph of, of, of Ian Crawford in the 1960s when he would have been about 40, in, in his 40s. But it's not just digging techniques that um, were important to him, but also scientific techniques for all the artifacts and finds that, uh, that came up from, from the work from the 31 seasons. He had built, I don't know where it came from, uh, he had what I would probably call a, a large greenhouse, uh, but it was probably a bit more than that. It became known as Crawford's Crystal Palace, where because of the light, uh, mainly uh, young girls or women, sorted out the finds and samples and recorded them from the excavation. I mean, this was your on-site finds hut, and a lot of good work was certainly done there. Now, through um, both Cambridge and Aberdeen universities, he had built or acquired um, a froth fr flotation machine so that all the dug sediment sediments from the site were processed for their environmental remains. Uh, now, this might sound ordinary today, but at the time this was quite revolutionary. And it is certainly one of the, the first uh, it, no recorded froth flotation machines uh, used in Scotland. And this concern over the environmental evidence, not just artifacts, but what people ate, um, what they dug, what um, they ploughed, all that evidence uh, we still have today. And um, I'm not quite certain what uh, this machine is, and perhaps there may be one or two of you in the audience that have an idea about that, but it may have been a track laying um, piece of equipment. But that will come to light in, in, in due course. As I said, I, I wanted to put um, Ian Crawford and the Yugal in context, and I, I, I think this lecture is actually forming to me as a, as a piece of research which I shall carry on with over the, the next uh, few years and investigate further in, into Ian Crawford and why he dug at the Udall. Uh, but I wanted to, to look at what else had happened in, um, in the UK, both before and, and during the time that, that Ian Crawford uh, worked at the Udall. Uh, we have the, the great excavations of Maiden Castle, Wheeler's famous site, and um, Gordon Child at Scarra Bray. We had others who investigated the remarkable Brock sites that are still um, public monuments at Gurness and Midhow, the Alsoff and Clifton in Shetland uh, and Orkney, or Orkney in Shetland. And so we, we had a tradition of um, large-scale excavations that did go on <coughs> for several years. But then looking at more contemporary excavations um, around the time that Ian Crawford started at the Udall in the 1960s, um, I've mentioned Sutton Who and the York excavations and some of the hill forts and rural sites and urban sites. But the one I feel that is its nearest in, in problems, shall I say, more than anything else, is mucking in Essex. That was an enormous excavation. It went on solidly for 13 years. So we're not talking of 31 years that Ian Crawford did, which I think equates to about six years in the field. Um, I think, on the whole, uh, the Udall was about a quarter of the size and produced about a quarter of the finds 
of mucking in Essex. But like mucking, it too, as I have already said, remains largely unpublished. And these sites are very important to our understanding not only of what happens in these areas, the, the techniques that were used, and really we, we need to, to get, them, get them published. Now I want to, to turn a little bit to tell you uh, a bit more about, um, as I've turned it, turned it here, the, the sites in the Maka. You can see from this wonderful um, image from Google Earth the, the amount of sand. That whole peninsula is sand overlaying um, bedrock in some cases. There are three main sites. Um, there's the Udall North. Get this to work. Yes, there's the Udall North um, with an eroded area that's clearly visible on this aerial photograph. And that's not just through excavation. It was, it was eroding before Ian Crawford started. To the south of that is another large sand hill known as the, the Udall South. And then on the coast, opposite a, a little uh, island with a tombolo, is what's known as RUX6. This was his Neolithic site, Neolithic Bronze Age. And I'll, I'll address each of these sites uh, in turn. I've had to do quite a bit of investigation of the archives for this lecture. So some of these slides, um, which we've managed to digitise, have never ever been, been shown before. So the quality will vary, so please excuse that. And I've supplemented by some modern, with some modern digital photographs where I can. So this is what Ian Crawford saw when he came to work. And I love the car. <coughs> but you can see from this picture in the top of the, the sand dune area, there are, um, there are walls, there are coarse stonework, things are going on. But you can see also see that the, the sand dune ha has eroded here. Um, this was, I think, two years later, and you can see the amount of soil that Ian had sifted away quite a large extent and the Crawford's Crystal Palace is not yet here so there's archaeology of the site huts as, as well that can be <laughs> considered uh, I'm sorry this doesn't have an awful lot of definition um, but the, the site is here it's still a very very large sand hill and most of the archaeology is now away. But I'm going to start at the things that Ian Crawford found first and then sort of work down in time, which is not necessarily the way I like to do it, but in this case, uh, I will. And I mentioned he found documents, the earliest being about 1495. I mean, most archaeologists I know, when it comes to documents, they go, you know, we're happy with prehistoric material, but documents and history are not really our, our forte. So Ian being a historian primarily, um, this was his thing. This is what he started with, with the documentation. Um, and he wanted to find the settlement that was mentioned in, in, this, in this documentation. And this is probably what he found first. It, the, elaborate structures of what was known as a taxman's house. Um, from what went previously, and I'll come to that in a moment, this was a mere shadow of earlier occupation. But what's interesting um, is, sorry, I'm just trying to get this to work. The little arrow, the arrow's not coming. Uh, <coughs> No little arrow. The, below the, the token or the gaming piece, there is a, a square-ended building with a doorway. Mm -hmm. You may be able to see that. Mm -hmm. And that is actually the remnant of a Norse house. And so I'll come back to the Norse house um, shortly. But that's 
parts of that building were in use for between four and five hundred years. Uh, and that's quite uh, an impressive uh, lineage. Ian Crawford has marked this plan as about 1697. That was basically the end of the Udall. From that time on, it looks like um, the weather patterns changed and more shell sand began to blow in, not only over the sand dunes, over the settlement, but also over the fields that were being cultivated. And it more or less stopped uh, the settlement. There was very little uh, above <coughs> this stratigraphically, uh, a few little bits of shielings and some walls, but other than that, this was the, the first and also the last settlement, uh, first that Ian Crawford found, but the last in, in the sequence. And here is part of the, the Norse house. You can see these straight walls and, and the doorway which is seen on the previous uh, plan. And it's, I think, as far as I know, it's the only longhouse of this period um, on the site. And I, I'm very sorry, I don't have a complete photograph uh, that I've been able to find of it all dug to the same, to the same level. So you can probably see its uh, extent. But never mind, I can't uh, easily show you the extent. Um, I've put on some of the, the more iconic finds from, from this settlement. Um, Ian Crawford thought it was a, a very high status uh, settlement. Um, we have what I, I, they're not beautiful pieces of pottery, but they're extremely interesting pieces of pottery. Uh, the top picture of the, the little open uh, vessel it's quite small, it would fit easily into your hand. The, the next piece lower down is part of a bake plate in ceramic. Um, some of you may, may know the bake stones from, from Norway that are, are found um, across Viking sites, usually made out of a, a schisty type of, of steatite or soapstone. But here mm. at the Udall, we have them in clay. We have uh, probably about four or five different types of, of uh, bake plates, um, that example being one. Beneath are four fragments of a Viking home case, and that, that is decorated. Um, there is a coin from, that I think is dated to, to about um, 1065 to 1066. This is a coin of um, mm -hmm. the Norwegian king, Harald Hardrada, or Harold Hard ruler, and then a piece uh, in the bottom left hand corner, uh, a piece of animal bone with a, a typical design, a step design, which is uh, probably indicative of Norse occupation. Now, Ian Crawford did write something in antiquity, he wrote an article with um, Warren Schwitzer uh, about what he'd found, I think it's dated. 1976, and he didn't really publish an awful lot more detail about the sites after that. So it's our intention in the future to, to investigate uh, both the, the site stratigraphy and the finds, put them back together, and try and sort out the, the full sequence of events and dates at, uh, at the site. Now, Ian Crawford. Um, thought originally these curved lines of rather large post holes were actually a Viking fort. And it was the focus of cremations and also Iron Age smelting, or, and later, sorry, later smelting of furnaces. And I put a picture of one of the furnaces, I think, in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, but reading a little bit more for this lecture, I realised he changed his mind that this was not uh, a Viking fort, but possibly a late Iron Age or Pictish one. So there is an anomaly there that we hopefully will be able to, to 
get to grips with a little bit later on. Now, coming down stratigraphically and back in time, we come to the late Iron Age settlement. Um, a lot of what we would call um, jelly baby type houses. Ian Crawford called them figure of eight. They had a lot of bone working, as you can see from this lovely Pictish comb. Um, typical Iron Age pottery, and some late Iron Age pottery. Uh, lots of bone pins. And the nearest equivalent that he knew at the time that was being excavated was Anna Rich's Bacoy Houses uh, on Orkney. He was actually breaking new ground. In more or less everything he did, he was doing something that very few other people have done, and very few other people have done in Scotland. And I think Anna Ritchie had <coughs> maybe two to three houses. We find that here at Udall we may have had eight, something like that. But in uh, the late 70s, I think he decided that he'd got enough information from this sand hill and moved to another part of the project here in Beagle South. But I wanted to show you, uh, this picture was taken in 1991 and this in nine, uh, 2005. And I think I have David Griffiths to, to thank for, for showing that. Some change, <coughs> but not necessarily a lot. So it means that the erosion perhaps is, is not as bad as, as we first thought. So it's useful to have this uh, archive of photographs that we can date to see how, how things have altered over time. I'm now moving to the, to the Udall South, which is, as you can see from this little inset of, of a map I've, I've put in, there's a number of little wheel houses, in fact, not just little, but large wheel houses. As you can see, shaped like circular, shaped like the spokes of a wheel, very much related to the Brock sites uh, that you may uh, be familiar with. There were ancillary structures to some of these sites. Um, and again, Ian Crawford was breaking new ground here because he found that some of these buildings actually were going back into the late Bronze Age. And it may seem remarkable to us today, but he was using radiocarbon dating for what must have been one of the first times in Scotland as well, because it was in its infancy. The, the, the modern way we uh, look at our radiocarbon dates and samples was not yet uh, tried and tested. So, and he was also um, using, or other people were experimenting on the Udall with thermal luminescence dating. So there's a lot of things that really uh, have lost their thunder because <coughs> he didn't write up at the time. Just like to show you uh, one of the smaller wheelhouses with now, I'm not entirely certain that these finds went with this wheelhouse, but these are typical finds of this period. Uh, it's just that we haven't actually done any research into this material yet. But there, there's some beautiful objects, and I, I hope you, you like the, the fragments of cones uh, that I've got in the bottom of the picture there. Um, black and white photograph of yet one of the other wheelhouses with a view out to the west and uh, to the site I'll come on to in a few moments. And two very typical finds from um, this period, um, part of a decorated vessel and obviously a little miniature sword. And uh, I am wondering whether that was to do with uh, weaving activities in um, beating down the, the weft or the warp uh, on the loom. It's very worn at one end. I mean, the, the, the hilts and the, the handle of the, the sword may have been used literally as a handle. And, uh, but a very, very nice, nice piece <coughs> there. He, Ian Crawford, that's him in the, the yellow, I think. I don't know who the, the other person is. Um, but again, um, he, he found interesting things, that these were not just 
habita habitations, um, or domestic habitations, they also had a ritual element. And in pits, in the floors of some of these buildings, were lamb burials. And if there was one, we must, we must have about 15, 20 lamb burials scattered throughout um, these buildings. So I don't, I don't know the whole story, so I can't give it to you, but there is a lot of interesting information tied up in this particular site. And just to show you um, what it looks like now, um, some of the, the buildings can still be seen. They've been fenced off so that um, cattle can't get in and uh, destroy them. And I think the, the local community is deciding how best to preserve these sites because they're the only ones of the whole project that, that still exist. Now if we go back in time to the Bronze Age and also to the Neolithic, and this is a coastal site, uh, it's no longer, no longer with us at all, it, it's disappeared. And in, early in the 1960s, he started to trench this area. And you can see the men uh, in the bottom of the picture, uh, local laborers, flat caps, vests, you know, it, it dates them, it puts them uh, at a specific time. Um, and Ian Crawford came back in the, in the 1970s, about 1974, um, to the little lump on the right hand side of the picture before the water. And that is, comes up now as this partly excavated um, cairn. It's very interesting that, that there was a, an exceptionally high tide com combined with the moon and the sun in certain phase, a perihelion tide, I think Ian Crawford called it. Um, and this site was not known about before. He, it had not been identified. He found a new type of monument, uh, a curved cairn, and it had three phases of evolution. And beneath that were about 50 pits dug into the sand, um, which he thought were completely empty. And it'd be very interesting to, to now go back over his documentation to find out what was actually going on there. Um, he found evidence of two Neolithic houses, two circular houses with associated finds, and we have <coughs> a stone, carved stone board in the left hand picture, and an axe, a little polished axe in situ uh, in the colour picture next to it, which have both come from, from these houses. And again, we, we need to have the radiocarbon dates now recalibrated for, for this site. It's not a particularly picturesque one from the point of view of the archaeology, but its setting is certainly magnificent and it must have been a pleasure to have, uh, have dug on this site. And you can see evidence of small lithic objects um, which are extremely tiny, showing you that the, the resources were not always easy for, for settlements in, the, in this area. These are actually of flint that must have come in with the, the sand from uh, the continental ridge out to the west. But uh, a lot of resources were, were based on quartz, local stone and, and turf and things like that. Well, in 1994, Ian Crawford stopped work um, at the Ugal. I don't know whether that was by design or whether certain things happened and he could not continue. But if you, I, I said about him taking his family, the dogs and everybody up to the Ugal, he also had to bring all these samples and stone and pottery back down with him. And during the course of the project, so he moved from Scotland to Cambridge and then back up to Scotland again. And all this material has been up and down the country uh, in more than one occasion. And unfortunately, some of it's got lost. Some of it, I don't know where it is, but can't get at it. 
And I do know other things are completely lost. Um, during the research for this lecture, I came across a reference to a silver ring. I, I have no idea where that is. I haven't, I've never, never seen it. I, I don't have a record of it at the moment, um, unless it's in Fine's cards. This movement of material also brought problems in that I, I, I'm, I've still got to research where he put it in Cambridge, but there was certainly water damage, we've had rodent damage, um, and, and I think in moving things, you know yourself in moving house, things get lost. Things have got lost here as well. And when I visited uh, Ian at his house in Dumfries and uh, he and his wife kindly showed me their basement, uh, I didn't really know what to think because this was one, one bay of, I think, four with all the finds. I mean, I, I could barely squeeze down to the end. It, the house was sort of built into the hill a little bit. Uh, I'd, I'd like you to remember the hay whiskey boxes. We will come back to those. And the, the tea chests. We had a huge number of tea chests to deal with later. Um, but at the time, he did his best with the resources that he had. You go shopping today, you go to a supermarket. You can buy freezer bags, you can put your food in freezers, you can put your finds in freezer bags. At the time you Crawford was digging at the Udall, there was no supermarkets on the Isle of Lewis. How he managed, I do not know. It was very, very difficult. And so I think we can only congratulate him and his family and for other people that worked on the archive in the past that we have as much remaining as we did. Now, sorry, I, sorry about this slide, but I had to put it in because I received a phone call, I think it was 1 November, yes, 2008, saying, do you want the stuff? Come and get it. What stuff? Everything. And what had happened was that Ian, unfortunately, had been suffering uh, from depression and possibly had also uh, become um, well, got the beginnings of dementia or, or Alzheimer's and had to go into a home and uh, his family were reorganising the house and, and all sorts of things. And so with the help of Historic Scotland, I went down, measured up how many finds and through a long series of other things, I won't, won't go into, we moved it. We moved it in safety. And the first thing I did, and it took a year to do this, was to re -ex well, to excavate the documentary archives. Now, I know some of you may have had to do this for, for relatives that have, been, have, have died, but to do this for, for, for a living person and to go through all his personal papers, everything that I got from the family, it was quite a traumatic uh, business, um, especially when deciding what to throw out and what to keep. You know, what do you do with multiple copies of papers, mostly handwritten? What do you do with newspaper cuttings? What do you do with notes that are on the back of bills from the butcher or out of your um, checkbook? What do you do with all these things? I had I extricated two kilograms of bulldog clips and paper clips from all this material. I had to deal with mould and damp and other damage. It was not a pleasant task, but at the end we, we've got, um, got it sorted out. I mean, th this is how I got it. And at least we've got this material and it will be handed over to the Royal Commission in Edinburgh in due course, but at least we've, we've got it. And then through another interesting series of uh, circumstances, um, in 2011, Historic Scotland paid for a two-year assessment of both the documentary archives 
and the fines and samples. And this has been a major job. It's all very well if you work on a site, you know what you've got, because you've dug it. But when, for example, myself and my team had not dug it, everything we looked at was like a Christmas parcel. It was a, a treasure trove of beautiful combs and, and, and other pieces. <coughs> everything we opened, every box, every bag was completely unknown to us. A very difficult task, not a pleasant task either, uh, I, I will say that. Um, so I, I've shown you little bits of the basement where some of the most of the finds were. Here's the Crystal Palace and today that's what we have of most of the finds. Is the animal bone is on the left hand side and at the back and the pottery on the right hand side and this is only from the Yugo North. This is from one site uh, with, with stone in the middle. So it's not up to museum standards, it's not been rebagged, but at least it's safe from damage from damp and, and vermin and uh, other things. So at least we've, we've done a containment exercise that will keep that in, uh, in some sort of order for the, for the future before and um, until we can work on it again. And due to the kind auspices of my former colleagues from the University of Glasgow, I managed to get a corner of their basement in their new premises anyway, uh, but the corner wasn't enough, so we expanded along the back wall. And you can see from um, not just um, colleagues working on artifacts, but the, the different boxes on, on the back wall and the different shapes of boxes and how it is more or less today. We've, got, we've done a tremendous amount of work. Uh, well, I haven't, but uh, my colleague Chris in the, in the picture there has. He, he, he's done a huge amount of work. But that, that's, that's what we've, we've done. We've, we, it's teamwork getting people in, assessing the material. How much is this going to cost to, to work on in the future? What have we got? What needs conservation? And let's get things into museum standard boxes. Um, it, it's just been uh, a very interesting and uh, quite demanding time. But another thing we, we have done, and this is a been at the request of the local North Uist communities. They never received very much information uh, about what was found at the, at the site. And so we were asked to put on an exhibition and uh, I produced a booklet and I have one or two of those here tonight if anybody would like, like them. Um, Last year, we actually went up as a small team to, to give a demonstration of what we do as archaeologists, you know, in stone and bone and plant remains. Um, what we do, we had school parties, we went on a tour of the sites, or what was left of them, and, and explained those for the local communities. And I think that's been very, 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 very valuable. We've also had lots of visiting academics and other visitors who've come and to see our, our work. But it makes me reflect on, on things. Uh, I think this is Ian Crawford in the red and black in the, in the picture, and uh, I think that's James Graham Campbell in the, the, the white and grey beside him in the centre there. And the, the, the sheer determination of Ian Crawford to keep <coughs> on going, keep on fact finding, keep on going back in time against what must have been extremely difficult circumstances. Um, just to point out that Ian and James Graham Campbell are actually together in the middle of the picture above the ladder again. Um, I think that may have been probably from the, the same season. It's very difficult if you don't write up and write some sort of narrative about what you've been finding to come back after 31 years and think, where do we start? Where do we start the story? 
What do we start with? How, how do we begin? Ian relied on a, a number of trusted staff to get uh, through the difficult process of excavation uh, on site for all that length of time. Um, the site, by all accounts, is enormous. And focusing on people's aims throughout 31 years must have been very difficult. Personally, I think Ian tried the impossible. I don't know whether he would admit defeat, but I would have done. Um, <coughs> and it, somehow I, I felt, uh, when I worked with him in, in around about 2000, that he was still very determined to write this up and do it himself. But this was far, far beyond the, the realms of just one person. You need a trusted team to carry on the work and to make it um, into a publishable uh, project. In 2011, John Schofield published a book called Great Excavations. The Udall should have been there. Without doubt, the Udall should have been there. And for all these reasons that I put down, it was in an inspirational excavation. We all knew it, it was legendary when I was working on Orkney in the 70s and 80s, this was the site. And Ian Crawford's name was more or less on everybody's lips. Um, a lot of what we did probably developed from his um, in innovation and how he worked on his sites. Um, he brought a lot of money and people to the islands. And this is a great social benefit, which islands still enjoy. Um, it was a legendary site, and Ian Crawford be has become legendary as well because of this site. But I personally, it's, my, it's only my personal opinion, th I think this site made him, made him who he was, but it also in a way destroyed him because I think it, he became riddled with defeat and disappointment that he could not publish as he wanted to publish. And because it was not published, it probably does not fulfill the requirements of a great excavation. There are lots and lots of people to acknowledge. I have had personally a huge amount of help uh, and comfort from a lot of people. This has not been a diff uh, an easy project. In fact, one of my uh, colleagues said, you've got a poison chalice there to be careful. <laughs> and it is a poison chalice. It still remains a poison chalice. But we can only hope that in the future we can get money to, to carry on. And I, I finish now with a, a little plea. Please, I'd love some stories. You've got the odd photograph, and I actually received two today from Northern Ireland from somebody who could not come today. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Beverly, for that. When we will be in town to fulfill your great project and a great person who will become part of the legends of archaeological history. Um, do we have any questions for our speakers tonight? Yes. <coughs> yes, please. At the risk of telling everyone, I put from you an email um, as one of the diggers from 70 something. We did receive an interim report, I still have it. It was sort of copied onto Fool's Cap, not A4, of course. Um, the day was memorable for many reasons, essentially being on an island where sort of sabbatarianism was rife, um, where the way of escaping back to Glasgow was to go onto the ferry at night and discover the bread man, and he would drive you from Lewis all the way back to Glasgow, um, another sort of delightful aspect. Um, from recollection in asking him why he was digging it, I thought he said he found it on an estate map. And his primary 
And perhaps I was hearing what I wanted to, but it was as if his primary purpose was actually a study of vernacular architecture to discover what pre-clearance houses were like. And it gradually became something more and more and more. But whether he actually found it on the map or just looking for it, I don't know. Um, from the point of view of technique, he was wearing socks in several of those pictures. And socks are very important because if you wear shoes, you need footprints. And digging sand would hold separate exercise. You had to have a long trowel, you had to hold the trowel vertically, you couldn't dig into it. And it is the only dig I have ever been on when every single bucket was sealed. The only excavation I've ever heard that was done. I don't have the flotation, but every single bucket was sealed on the side. Um, so what would happen sand dunes and the sea and the spring flowers? It was deeply memorable. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Yes, please. <coughs> um, I was a digger from 1966 to 68, ending up as a site su supervisor along with James Graham Campbell. And what I remember particularly about digging on the site was the flies, which was never easy. I don't know if they're still there. It must have been a bit like the Western Desert in the Second World War. You were just surrounded by flies, whatever you were doing. Um, I think one of the paradoxes of um, um, the context of the excavation uh, in the way that you looked at it in the 1960s and 70s was that uh, it was a time when other medieval archaeologists were just beginning to introduce single context recording and metric grid, and I think particularly of Brian Davison and uh, Martin Biddle, uh, their excavations. And I wonder whether, uh, because um, Ian Crawford used a very different system of recording. He used to interpret things as he went along and assign letters A, B, C and so on to whatever he thought was the sequence. I wonder whether you're going to have to um, recreate that unique system, uh, unique context recording system and the metric grid in writing up the excavation. Yes, please. Um, Ian Crawford uh, argued on the one occasion I heard him speak and in other things, that there'd been a very violent Viking of imprint on this site, destroying Pictish buildings, and he quoted the fort as evidence of that. So I'm interested to see that the fort has now been uh, perhaps rethought in that respect. <coughs> now, we're actually, we're now, it was quite obvious at the re recent Viking Congress that we're having trouble characterising the early Viking period in Scotland. Uh, that long house with the hard rather coin is perfect for the sort of developed phase, mm -hmm. and there are numerous comparisons to that in the Northern Isles, as you know. But um, the early stuff, the 9th century, early 10th, such as there is in, in, in that we have, is quite often very, very closely associated with so called Pictish buildings, and seems to be a development of the Pictish phase. In uh, perhaps belying this idea that there was a complete cultural break. Um, so it would be very interesting to see through your work how many Norse or Norse style artifacts there may be that are associated with what he argued were the Pictish buildings or whether they perhaps need to be re rethought in that respect. And just one more point. Um, obviously, you did show one of my slides, which I'm very grateful to you for. I went there on my own in a very desolate day in 2005 and um, one thing I found very interesting about the site was the wreckage of Crawford's tents and his sheds, a lot of which lies out there and is all, almost an archaeological site uh, in its own right above and beyond all the Iron Age and Viking stuff so uh, that I hope is uh, going to be recorded before it finally blows away Thank you Yes um, I think that uh, to avoid any, any, any potential confusion there at the point that David has just raised, the actual question about the, 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 the fault, the interface between the late Pictish and, and, and the Viking revival, uh, is not so much associated with the Panasadi thing, it was actually a stone construction on, on the very peak of the on summit of the site, which was, which was uh, uh, of short lived uh, duration. Uh, is indeed, of course, the, 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 the North uh, long house that was shown is, 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 the late, is the late North uh, phase of the house uh, of the settlement. Uh, and the, uh, early Viking, the, the earliest Viking Age presence on the site does certainly remodel uh, 
uh, some of the Pictish period uh, buildings and incorporates, as we see in other sites, incorporates uh, elements uh, of it. So there's, there's very definitely uh, a takeover of the site, how it was, I, I, I don't know, but there is, there is some maybe that, that evidence there. So I'll just to deal with that specific point, because I really would like to say uh, someone I think I can't miss, so I'll go, I, I suspect something over a year of my life. <laughs> Uh, actually living at, uh, working at New York. Um, um, how very grateful we are to Beverly for having taken on this, uh, this, this, this poison chalice um, and wishing her well for, uh, for the future and that we might indeed see it through uh, to the publication that, 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 that we wanted. But of course it is true that we have never anticipated, never looked for 5,000 years uh, of, 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 of settlement history. Uh, and indeed, yes, he wanted to find, as he did find, a pre-clearance settlement. Um, and it just so happened, pre-clearance settlement was sitting on top of, <laughs> a man went back to, to, um, to, 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 to the late Iron Age. Um, yes, in checking out the what happened in the South Stand Hill, it turned out to be two houses that went back to the Bronze Age. In doing some best archaeology, and what we formerly hoped was going to be the Viking burial, but I'm, uh, as a sort of, the, it was a part. It was a rescue excavation, um, looking at that can. Uh, it was the only thing that we thought of anywhere in the area uh, that could potentially have been a, a Viking burial. Sadly for me, of course, it turned out not to be. But unfortunately for you, it was sitting on top of a whole lot uh, of even earlier archaeology, which was definitely at risk. So that moved into the rescue phase. Uh, so the site simply just grew and grew and grew, uh, and indeed sort of got. Out of control uh, in the sense of being uh, something that the one man possibly uh, hoped to, um, to, to, to see through to publication. So, uh, more power to Wilbur and um, the best of luck. Thank you. Um, Adrian, you wanted to come I, I mean, unlike many in the audience, I have no connection with you at all. And I'd like to thank you for, for an incredibly interesting uh, lecture and an interesting experience. I was, however, uh, and participated for quite a long time in the mucking expeditions, where you drawn a number of comparisons, and mucking did excite the same sorts of feelings, and did generate many of the same problems, as you know only too well. One of the things that Chris Evans did when he was carrying through a role that was sort of fairly analogous to your own role at Moodle was that he he actually commissioned. Uh, a number of pieces from people who had been on the excavation, uh, actually to, to record their their feelings about the site. Not, not, not in terms of trying to capture archaeological information, but in trying to capture some of that social history of the site as it ran through several generations of archaeologists. And I would recommend that to you, because I think we all found it an interesting experience, it was also a very cathartic experience. Nothing was one of the most unpleasant sites to have worked on in the universe. I think the contour of the Thames gravel was the. And the one thing that everyone talked about when we read the compilation of essays was how horribly, bitterly cold it was and how difficult a person, however magnificent she might have been, how difficult a person Margaret Jones was to work for in this place. So I think there's a very interesting social. Strata that runs through what you were saying. Thank you. Uh, just one more question down here, please. Yes. Yes, I, I would like to say thank you very much for the splendid talk which brought together all the legendary aspects of it. Uh, I too heard that it was a legendary site and went to visit it when I went to the uh, Western Isles. Uh, unfortunately, not when he was there, but <clears throat> I was determined to get an article on the Ugo. So uh, I contacted Ian and uh, I managed to get down to his cottage in Dumfrieshire and I think I spent three or four days there extracting from him the story of his excavations. And then I remember at the end of it I said, well Ian, I now want some illustrations. Have you got uh, a slide box with all your favourite slides in it? He said, oh no, nothing like that. I have my slides here about 5,000 of them, but they're, you know, they're all in order, but they're not selected. 